So today, you guys, we are going to learn about two amazing abolitionists. We are going to learn about William Lloyd Garrison and about an awesome author by the name of Harriet Beecher Stowe. Both of these people did amazing things as far as speaking up for the slaves and about abolishing slavery, but they both did it in very unique and different ways. And we're going to learn about those ways uh, today. So the first person we're going to learn about is uh, the guy that you see in the top left-hand corner of the page here. His name is uh, William Lloyd Garrison. Now, William Lloyd Garrison was a newspaper writer. Um, he wrote an abolitionist newspaper called The Liberator. And this Liberator newspaper basically spoke out about slavery. And William Lloyd Garrison was very much radical uh, back in his day and really spoke out heavily uh, against slavery. First of all, I want to tell you that the information that you are seeing on this page is going to be available to you as a PDF, and you can find it on Schoology. So make sure that you download it and you put it in Notability and file it in Social Studies, um, even under the Civil War. So let's talk a little bit about William Lloyd Garrison. So as I told you, he published a newspaper called The Liberator. This was a very militant, anti-slavery newspaper. When I say militant, it means that he spoke out very strongly and very heavily um, against slavery. He was also uh, he also called for the complete and immediate abolition of slavery across the board. Now, if you think about the times back then, this was a very radical thing to do because slavery was needed so badly economically. People needed to make money. The country needed to make money. And when you remove something like slavery and you want to abolish it completely, you are basically ripping out the economical foundation of our country. And he believed that slavery was a sin and those that maintained it were criminals. He was a very deeply religious man and slavery went against his religious beliefs. And he truly believed that if you took part of slavery, you were considered a criminal. We're going to watch a really cool video right now on William Lloyd Garrison to really give you an idea of how radical he was and the ideas that he had. But scattered around the country, a few lonely souls were convinced that slavery was a crime against God and man. And in Boston, one of them was coming to understand that God intended he do something about it. William Lloyd Garrison felt that he was destined to do great things but he had no idea how to get there. In 1828, he was 22 years old, newly arrived in the city from his hometown of Newburyport. Garrison's father, a seaman and a drunk, had abandoned the family when Garrison was two years old. Plunged into poverty, Garrison's mother left her children for years on end as she looked for work. But in their time together, she managed to drum a fierce Christian conscience into her son. William Lloyd Garrison's religious background was not just a background. It was at the core of who he was. It was an indwelling spirit inside of him that constantly thought about making God's will come into being on this earth. Shortly after arriving in Boston, Garrison happened to meet an itinerant publisher who was raising money for his one-man anti-slavery newspaper. Garrison was horrified by descriptions of the slave pens where men, women, and children were held awaiting shipment further south. And he began to think that ending slavery was the cause that could give meaning to his life. Now, another amazing person during this time period was Harriet Beecher Stowe. And she was an author, and she always wasn't an author, and that's the amazing thing. Um, she wasn't like an established writer, and she was a woman. Now, those two things back then, it's really amazing that she had such a successful um, book that she published. And she published a book called Uncle Tom's Cabin. And if you're interested in reading this, I do have a copy available um, in my classroom. But what it did is it portrayed how cruel slavery was. And this book truly moved readers like nothing else ever had. 
this was like almost like reading a horror story back then. And it really like awoke the North and made them really feel slavery. Even Queen Victoria in England, she wept over it. And within a year, over one and a half million copies were in print worldwide. Now, you have to remember, one and a half million copies back then was massive because the populations weren't as large as they are now. So the reason why she wrote this novel was in a direct response to the Fugitive Slave Act. She was outraged that people from the South can come into the North and take, you know, free slaves or blacks that were already free and claiming that they were slaves. And this was happening. And she looked at it as like almost like an invasion from the South into the North. Um, Anti-slavery fiction books back then, they didn't really sell well. That was a real political thing and people were afraid of it. So her book, Doing Well, was a huge shock. And again, she wasn't an established writer. So it was a shock that a woman back then gained so much popularity because women weren't really considered to be valuable or even people. Uh, her purpose for writing the book, in her own words, was to awaken sympathy and a feeling for the African race. And she wanted to urge readers to feel right about the issue. And in the South, well, the book was viewed as propaganda, right? To ruin their way of life. I mean, of course, that was gonna, they were going to feel that way because in their minds, the Southern way of life was to have slavery. And when someone's writing a book that is going against that, of course, they're going to view it as propaganda to turn the world against them. And in the North, well, it was basically like a romance novel. It's like, of course, they were against slavery. So they looked at this as being something that was like morally perfect and something that should be spoken out against. But the one thing that was really shocking, especially to me when I read this book, is that the book, instead of directly blaming the slave owners who went out to these auctions and purchased slaves and who abused the slaves, she blamed the institution of slavery itself. So as you can see, I'm standing outside a plantation deep in the heart of the Confederacy. And the reason why I'm standing here is because next I want to show you a video that was a reenactment of a letter that was written by a slave to her owner. This owner had actually written her a letter trying to convince her to pay her money for her escaping or to come back. And this is the slave's response back to the landowner. It's truly a brilliant piece of writing. So really listen carefully, closely to it and for the words that she's saying, and listen to the things that she's saying, because they are truly amazing. I would even recommend maybe going back and listening to it two or three times to truly understand what is being said and to feel the emotion of it. The words of everyday Americans who made a difference. The people speak. Benjamin Bratt reads a letter from a runaway slave replying to his former master. You sold my brother and sister, Abe and Ann, and 12 acres of land, you say, because I ran away. And now you have the unutterable meanness to ask me to return and be your miserable chattel, or in lieu thereof, send you $1,000 to enable you to redeem the land, but not to redeem my poor brother and sister. If I were to send you money, it would be to get my brother and sister, and not that you should get land. You say you are a cripple, and doubtless you say this to stir my pity, for you knew I was susceptible in that direction. And I do pity you from the bottom of my heart. Nevertheless, I am indignant beyond the power of words to express that you should be so sunken and cruel as to tear the hearts I love so much all in pieces, that you should be willing to impale and crucify us all out of compassion for your poor foot or leg. Wretched woman, be it known to you that I value my freedom to say nothing of my mother, brothers, and sisters more than your whole body. More indeed than my own life, more than all the lives of all the slaveholders and tyrants under heaven. Now you say you have offers to buy me and that you shall sell me if I do not send you $1,000. And in the same breath and almost in the same sentence, you say, you know, we raised you as our own children. Woman, did you raise your own children for the market? Did you raise them for the whipping post? Did you raise them to be driven off, bound to a coffle, a group of slaves being driven to market in chains? Wretched woman, do you say you did not do it? 
Then I reply, your husband did, and you approve the deed, and the very letter you sent me shows that your heart approves it all. Shame on you. But by the way, where is your husband? You don't speak of him. I infer, therefore, that he is dead, that he has gone to his great account with all his sins against my poor family upon his head, poor man. Gone to meet the spirits of my poor, outraged, and murdered people in a world where liberty and justice are masters. And you say I am a thief because I took the old mare along with me. Have you got to learn that I had better right to the old mare, as you call her, than Maniseth Logue had to me? Is it a greater sin for me to steal his horse than it was for him to rob my mother's cradle and steal me? Before God in high heaven, is there a law for one man which is not a law for every other man? If you or any other speculator on my body and rights wish to know how I regard my rights, they need but come here and lay their hands on me to enslave me. The proposition is an outrage and an insult. I will not budge. Not one hair's breadth. I will not breathe a shorter breath even to save me from your persecutions. I stand among a free people who I thank God sympathize with my rights and the rights of mankind. And if your emissaries and vendors come here to re-enslave me and escape the unshrinking vigor of mine own right arm, I trust my strong and brave friends in this city and state will be my rescuers and my avengers. For more of The People Speak, go to history.com slash peoplespeak.